Herman. Welcome to Understanding Wisconsin's Courts and Judicial Elections. This is the first in a special fair court series from the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. We will be presenting at least uh, three others this spring. The series will be recorded for those who can't be with us live, and it will also be available on the State League's website. And this is also being recorded and streamed on Wisconsin Eye. We have also enabled the Zoom captions. So if you would like to use the captions feature, please click on the captions icon at the bottom of your screen. I'm Joy Cardine. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. Some of you may remember me as a talk show host at Wisconsin Public Radio. I will be your moderator today as we offer an introduction to the structure and function of Wisconsin courts and the importance of voting and engaging in judicial elections. We are doing this fair court series because the league believes that fair and independent courts are important to our democracy, our communities, and to our daily lives. And that we hope that the more we understand about our courts, the more likely we will be in voting in judicial elections. We have a number of judicial elections on the local ballots statewide on April 5th. In future webinars, we are going to look at some of the issues that are threatening to undermine our courts, like dark money, weak recusal rules, racial disparities, and too few people of color serving as judges and attorneys. And we will also look at the reforms and actions that are needed to correct these wrongs. I know our speakers might also have uh, some thoughts on those issues as well. Today, we are going to hear first from UW Whitewater political scientist, Jolly Emery. She will give us an overview of the Wisconsin court system. And then we will hear from retired judge Paul Higginbotham, who will share his perspective from his experience on the bench. And we want to hear from you too. If you have any questions for either of our speakers, please write them in chat and I will present them to our speakers, perhaps as we go along, but certainly after they conclude. So let's get started. Jolly Emery is an associate professor and chair of the political science department at UW Whitewater. Emery is also the director at the Center for Political Science and Public Policy Research. She teaches legal studies courses, researches judicial issues. She was a frequent guest with me on Wisconsin Public Radio whenever courts were in the news. So hello, Professor Emery, and for being with us today. It's good to uh, talk with you again. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. So um, today, uh, thank you, Molly. Today, I'm going to present a few slides on Wisconsin court system and um, a bit on uh, different issues with respect to the overall function of the courts and um, uh, things that courts do so that we can understand Wisconsin courts better including um, the election process for selecting our judges in Wisconsin. Next slide, please, Molly. So what I'll be going over is the structure of courts in Wisconsin and their functions, the role of courts in a healthy democracy, how courts affect our daily lives, and judicial elections. Next slide, please. Thank you. This slide shows us the Wisconsin court system overall. Um, if we start at the top, we have the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Supreme Court includes seven justices who serve 10 year terms. The jurisdiction with regard to the cases that and controversies that the Supreme Court hears is appellate, which means that they review cases from lower courts. So their job is to check decisions that are made on lower courts for any kind of what's called reversible error. Uh, was there a procedural error? Uh, for example, did um, at a criminal trial, did a judge inadvertently allow some sort of evidence which should have been excluded? Or did police um, function in a way that violates the Wisconsin State Supreme Court or um, the Supreme Court of the United States? 
The Supreme Court of Wisconsin also has what's called discretion. And discretion is a great thing to have if you're a judge or a court, because what you get to do is pick and choose the cases that you want to hear. So what the justices on the Supreme Court do in Wisconsin is they go through what are called petitions for review. Those cases coming from lower courts where people believe that there's some sort of error, some problem with regard to the decision making or the procedure that happened at the lower court and ask the Supreme Court to review those cases um, and to see if there's that error. And so the Supreme Court can decide, the justices can decide whether or not they want to take those petitions. They usually get um, around a thousand petitions per year and they take about a hundred cases. So if you want to appeal um, your outcome in a lower court to the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, you have about a 10% chance of getting them to review your case. Another function of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court is administrative authority over all Wisconsin courts. So they are the administrative body of the court system of Wisconsin. Now, next we have the Court of Appeals. This is called Intermediate Appellate Court, and most states have Intermediate Appellate Courts. It's called Intermediate because it's in between the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the lower courts. And in the courts of appeals, as the slide reads, include 16 judges in Wisconsin. They serve six-year terms and they're divided into four districts across the state. Courts of appeals in Wisconsin have appellate jurisdiction too. So they review cases from lower courts, primarily the circuit courts. And unlike the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, the court of appeals, they have to take every single petition that comes before them and make a decision. They have to do something with every piece of paper that comes before them as a petition. They do not have discretion over their docket. So um, they have a lot of work before them. If you lose at the Court of Appeals, then you would appeal to the Wisconsin Supreme Court to review their decision. Below the Court of Appeals, we have the circuit courts. The circuit courts are the trial courts of the Wisconsin state system. They include, as the slide reads, 253 judges. These judges also serve six-year terms, and um, they are seated within counties. These courts are what we call courts of general jurisdiction because they take all types of cases. They are trial courts that resolve criminal matters between uh, 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 criminal matters, and they also resolve civil matters within their jurisdictions. Um, they do have a little bit of appellate jurisdiction, and that's a bit of a unique feature to Wisconsin. So they can sometimes review decisions of municipal courts, but those decisions to municipal courts can come above to the Court of Appeals for review. Then there's municipal courts. Municipal courts are the courts that I think most of us are probably familiar with. They are courts that deal with local ordinances, with traffic fines, with um, whatever kind of tickets that you might get within a city or a town or a village. And um, there are 232 municipal court judges in Wisconsin and they serve four year terms. Next slide, please. So it's really important to understand that the general function of courts is to resolve legal problems. They exist to resolve legal problems with legal solutions. So you can only come to court if you have a legal problem and you can only have a court look at your case if they have a legal solution to offer to that problem. So that's really important for us to understand. To understand. But it's also important for us to understand that courts play a very important role in a healthy democracy. Um, I think we're all aware that they are one of the branches of government. And so with separation of powers and checks and balances, the courts serve as an important check on the legislative branch, on the executive branch at both the federal level and the state level. They make certain that the other branches of government aren't exceeding what their powers are according to the state constitution or in some instances, the federal constitution. They also make certain that we as individuals are kept accountable to the law. Um, and you know, no one really wants to have to go to court, but sometimes we need to for a variety of reasons. And so they keep us accountable with respect to uh, making certain that we are abiding by the law and there is a lot of law. Um, they also serve 
really important functions with regard to democracy, kind of the big D. So you think of democracy with a capital D in the sense of how democracies functions or features of democracies. So examples of this would be that courts are public. In the United States, we have public proceedings in our courtrooms so that people can come in and watch how a trial operates. We can see what judges do and we can learn from them. Um, we often have trials by jury. That is a right that you have. And juries are selected from a cross section of the community. So these are lay persons. These are folks like you and me who can be selected to serve. And then we decide as jurors what the outcome is of a trial. We learn about specifics of the law and we determine whether or not a party wins. And you also determine that on a jury by voting, which obviously is an important democratic feature. Um, and the press is also involved. So the press, you know, we can't always all fit in a courtroom, but the press comes and it sits in there kind of as the fourth estate of government and it observes what's going on in courtrooms and it reports back to us. So there are so many ways in which courts add to our democracy in the United States. And it's really important to understand that. Next slide, please. So I think it's also important for us to widen the lens. I tell my students this all the time, why courts matter and who is on our courts matter. Um, without the courts, we wouldn't achieve, have achieved a lot of things in um, the United States, in our society. Racial desegregation in public and private life occurred because of the courts. Removal of barriers for women in many areas of life because of discrimination based upon sex, or gender, um, is because of court action, court cases, people coming to the courts as another venue to vet out political issues because legislatures were unresponsive. Um, expansion of protections against discrimination employment for LGBTQ persons is an issue that is new and the courts have been involved in this and provided them more protections under Title VII, which has to do with discrimination in employment. Uh, Interracial marriage and same-sex marriage are uh, rights that have come to us through the courts and court decisions. Right to privacy and reproductive rights, which is a pretty important issue right now um, on the United States Supreme Court agenda, but also on many state Supreme Courts agendas. These came about to us because of court rulings. That right to privacy is a judicial construct. Judges decided that we have a right to privacy. And then of course, reproductive rights were also um, created in the right to privacy by the courts. Um, other types of things that sometimes we don't even think about. Courts often act as what we call street level bureaucrats, right? So the Supreme Court or Congress or some other um, government entity, maybe a bureaucracy, will come up with some rulings or some policy. And it's not fully fleshed out. It's not completely vetted. And so they often, courts often act in filling in the blanks as these street level bureaucrats with respect to certain rights or with respect to legislation and how that legislation applies to certain persons. And um, the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act is a really good example of this, that state courts have been involved across the country in determining what types of rights people are, um, should be permitted under the ADA and what it means to have reasonable accommodations and how um, persons with disabilities should be included or expanding that inclusion um, of persons with disabilities and providing more access to them. And then of course, as an organization that is very concerned with voting, um, redistricting and reapportionment. So um, the courts, uh, didn't really get involved in this type of issue until the 1960s, but once they opened the door to states being able to bring their uh, cases involving redistricting and reapportionment, um, the courts have played a really fundamental role in um, enforcing that one person, one vote, or perhaps maybe not enforcing one person, one vote from time to time. So I think. These are just some reasons and some issues that illustrate why courts are so important and then who is on our courts is also so important. 
Next slide, please. So why do we elect judges at the state level? Um, Joy already brought up ju judicial independence and how judicial independence is really important. The federal courts have one method for selection. All federal judges, whether you're on the district courts, which are the trial courts, the federal court system, Court of Appeals, which is their intermediate appellate court, or the United States Supreme Court, you are appointed for life with good behavior. One method of selection. And so that appointment process, life with good behavior, um, philosophically means that you do have this independence. You don't have to worry about your seat on the bench if you make decisions that some people might find you know, um, unpleasant, or you don't have to worry about losing your seat because of some sort of electoral accountability. Um, and you can make decisions without you know, fear of some kind of reprisal from say the executive branch or the legislative branch or the public. But one of the concerns with regard to that kind of independence or that kind of appointment for life with good behavior is, well, what happens if you know, judges fall out of step with what society wants, with what we the people want, what, with what the public thinks is important? What if they are making decisions that don't reflect our preferences? There's really nothing we can do, right? We are stuck with them unless they choose to retire. And you know, there is an impeachment process, but it doesn't happen that often. And it's um, a really difficult way to remove judges from the bench. So states allow for some accountability and that accountability is through the election process. So having some sort of method of election for selecting your judges means that if you find that judges are out of step with what you as you know, most of the electorate in the state want in terms of decision-making or within a particular jurisdiction or district, if you're elected at that level, um, you know, want, then you can remove them from the bench and replace them with someone else. So that's kind of the difference between independence and accountability. You can hold people accountable. And the threat of re-election to keep your seat may pressure some judges, and I'm sure that judge on our panel can talk to that a bit more, but may, you know, they may think about that, or maybe they don't. Maybe they just don't really care um, because they know that they are making the best decisions um, for people within their jurisdiction, their district, their state. Next slide, please. So with respect to how we select our judges in Wisconsin, all judges in Wisconsin are selected by nonpartisan election, regardless if you serve at the municipal court level or the Wisconsin Supreme Court level. Um, our elections are held in the spring and April. As I mentioned before, Supreme Court justices serve 10 year terms, courts of appeal judges and circuit court judges serve six year terms and municipal, excuse me, municipal court judges serve four year terms. Nonpartisan elections is the most common method of judicial selection at the state level for municipal trial and intermediate appellate courts. Um, it's the second most common method for selecting state high court judges. There is another system called merit selection where there is an appointment first to this um, high court, whether it's the Supreme Court or some other name. Um, and after a period of time, you run for what's called a retention election. But there are other methods. So some states have partisan elections. Um, some states have appointment. And then some states have appointment by governor or by the legislative branch. Next slide, please. Um, so the importance of Wisconsin, I want to bring this back to Wisconsin. I teach a course called uh, Legal Research and Writing. And every year, I teach it every spring, we look at cases that are pending on the Supreme Court's docket or petitions that are pending for review by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the United States. And I don't know why I should be surprised, but I'm always a bit surprised at the number of cases that come before petitions or cases that land on the Supreme Court's docket. Wisconsin plays a really important role, not just with respect to what happens to us, those of us who live the state, but also with the nation. 
there are many important issues or matters of law that come from Wisconsin and influence the national legal and political agenda because they have gotten themselves on the United States Supreme Court docket. So these include things like the rights of the criminally included criminally accused, including penalty enhancement for hate crimes. That comes from Wisconsin. Um, free exercise of religion, freedom of association, voting rights, and most recently, partisan redistricting. So Wisconsin is so important on so many levels and so many decisions either made here by courts within our state or made at the United States Supreme Court level affect us and affect our daily lives. Next slide, please. So I'm listed here some resources for you. These are sites that I've used um, to put this together. Uh, Wisconsin State Courts, uh, great. There's so much information there. Anything you want to know about the courts, you can find there. There are links to the constitution, links to statutes with respect to the courts themselves, links to important cases. So I encourage you to go there if you want to look for more information. Also, um, the National Center for State Courts. If you're interested with respect to how Wisconsin compares um, in terms of how our courts are structured, the function of our courts, and with respect to the different methods of selection for judges, um, either at the trial court level or at the appellate court level, you can find that at the National Center for State Courts. They do a lot of great analysis. And then if you're someone like me who really enjoys learning a lot about the Supreme Court in the United States, and different cases. And if you're looking for a lot of analysis on these cases, that's um, very layperson friendly. I've included a SCOTUS blog. SCOTUS blog is Supreme Court of the United States blog. It's something that is run by um, attorneys, many appellate attorneys. And um, there's lots of great analysis about cases that are pending in the Supreme Court or that have been decided by the Supreme Court. And so I encourage you to um, look at that if you're interested. And finally, I'd like to say, as Joy mentioned, that it's really important to vote on April 5th. And with respect to courts and the April 5th election, a recent decision coming from the Wisconsin Supreme Court actually involves that election and um, uh, absentee ballots. The Supreme Court, Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that we cannot use drop off boxes for absentee ballots for the spring election on April 5th. So we get affected in so many ways with respect to court decisions. And I wanna thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Emery. We will get to uh, Judge Higginbotham in just a moment, but because it's so related, I, I wanted to present one question from one of our attendees um, when it comes to judicial elections versus appointments, she, Deborah says, but elections require money and money can make people beholden to others. So is that a problem? And what's uh, what's in place to stop the so-called uh, pay for play? So yes, that's so important. And I know you're going to have a webinar where you're going to talk about the influence of money, dark money, I think you spoke about um, on judicial elections. And that's very concerning. And judges find it concerning too. Judges um, want to be obviously perceived as legitimate. They don't want to be perceived as bought. They don't want to be perceived the same as politicians who run for office as candidates. Um, and so, you know, money is a huge issue. Even if you look um, at Wisconsin with respect to our Supreme Court elections, the amount of money that sometimes is involved um, is pretty staggering. And it's staggering for a couple of reasons. It's in the millions. So the millions, um, which is a lot of money, but it's staggering because of voter turnout. So voter turnout for judicial elections tends to be pretty low. Um, you know, somewhere maybe in the teens with respect to turnout for eligible voters. And when you think about all the money that's spent on those elections and the few eligible voters that actually participate and if you try to calculate per vote what that translates to, that's really disconcerting. And in some states, um, money has played a really compelling role with regard to not only elections, but cleaning house. I mean, entire courts have been swept out because of campaigns and money spent by special interest groups. The problem is money equals speech. 
And so money in elections is incredibly hard to regulate, but it is, you know, obviously a big concern and it's going to continue to be a concern. Thank you, Professor Emery. So let us uh, hear from now, Judge Paul Higginbotham. He was appointed to District 4 of the Wisconsin Court of Appeals in 2003. He was the first African American to serve as a Wisconsin Appellate Court judge. He did not seek re-election and retired in 2017. Judge Higginbotham was also elected as a Dane County Circuit Court judge in 1994. He also served as a City of Madison Municipal Judge in 1992. Governor Evers appointed uh, Paul Higginbotham to a panel of retired judges that selected the People's Maps Commission to redraw Wisconsin's legislative boundaries in a nonpartisan way. And he has also been a columnist for the Madison Capital Times. Thank you so much for being with us today, Judge Higginbotham. Well, thanks a lot, Joy. And uh, I really appreciate the uh, League of Women's Voters uh, holding this webinar as well as the uh, planned webinars in the future. And, and, and uh, uh, Jolly, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was very informative as somebody who has been involved in the court system for many, many, many years. I thought the information that you provided was very helpful. Um, so that, that's really great. Yeah, and uh, me too. I learned a lot. So uh, good teaching, uh, Jolly. Uh, Judge Higginbotham, we... You have sat on the bench for a, a very distinguished career in many different levels, municipal, circuit court, and, and appellate. What is, tell us about that. Tell us, what, what, what is the day in the life of a judge like? Well, of course, it really turns on at what level of court you're right. on. When I was on uh, the city of Madison's municipal court, and by the way, I was the first municipal judge for the city of Madison. That's right. So I helped build that court up. It was um, a lot of the day was spent uh, in the in the office uh, doing paperwork and doing some legal research, but also a good part of the day was spent on the bench, holding hearings, have, allowing people to present uh, their uh, defense to citations that were issued to them. And as you indicated earlier, there's a broad cross section of issues, but it all comes down to that they're municipal law violations, such as parking tickets, dogs, uh, trash, uh, speeding tickets, all, all of that kind of stuff. So it was, it's a pretty routine uh, kind of day when you're on the municipal court. Uh, it's not as uh, exciting as what happens on the circuit court and on the appellate courts. But shifting to the circuit court, because circuit judges, have jurisdiction over um, all cases involving state law. That could be juvenile court, criminal court, civil court, and that involves wide variety of cases and in, in even um, uh, mental commitment hearings. Um, it's a real varied day. And some days uh, a judge can be on the bench all day long and not have an opportunity to work uh, in their chambers. And if you have uh, jury trials that go on for weeks, that's the job that you're doing in a regular day. And, uh, and that, that involves a whole uh, cross-section of, of work. On the appellate court, it's a lot, lot different than it is in the lower courts. We're in chambers, cases come to us in uh, legal briefs. These are people making uh, arguments and writing to us. We have a record before us that is from the lower court. Uh, so we take a look at what the facts are, the transcripts, uh, what exhibits have been uh, presented, as well as the legal arguments made by the parties. And we do a lot of research and we work with uh, other judges because we sit on panels of three. And um, a case can take a long time to, to be decided, but it's a real entirely different world. We have to make decisions based on the law and on the facts that are before us. Not to say that you don't do that in the other courts, but we cannot take facts. We have to make the decisions based on the facts as they were presented to us. And, um, and, the, and it's very similar with, uh, with the Supreme Court. They're, they're not too much different from us in that regard. What was it like running uh, for election to be um, elected judge? Um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and when I, when I ran for my first term for Dane County Circuit Court, um, I spent 
about $32,000 in that race, which was the most of any uh, circuit court race in, in Dane County's history at the time. Um, and I had to attend numerous events, meet a whole slew of people in a wide variety of different uh, uh, situations and circumstances, I built a committee that uh, helped me uh, run the campaign and plan the campaign, and make networks so that I can continue to contact people. And I had staff uh, raise money. Judges cannot ask for money. That is according to uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court rules, which makes it very, very different than uh, people such as running for the state legislature or the common council uh, or a town board. Judges cannot ask for money. So you have to have a staff member do that for you. And that makes it very, very complicated. Um, but it's a, it's a grueling job. And I ran for the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 2002. And statewide elections are very, very difficult. They're grueling, they're very tiring, and a heck of a lot of money comes into play. Although when I ran for the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court, um, one of the uh, candidates I was running against is, is uh, current Justice Pat Rogensack, who was on the Court of Appeals. And um, that race, was the last race that did not involve a huge amount of money. From then on, it's been entirely different in Wisconsin. Um, and it's, it's, it's horrible, I think it's out of control. But it was a really grueling thing, but at the same time, it was really great to meet all these different people. You, you really get a sense about the people who live in Wisconsin and how wonderful they are and how thoughtful they can be. Uh, I really enjoyed that part of it. I loved meeting people. I still love meeting people. So that was great. So what do you do if um, one of your campaign contributors uh, is going to be in a case before you? Well, personally, and I'll speak in a minute about what the Wisconsin Supreme Court has done with that idea. Uh, personally, um, I would first take a look at, A, did I even know it? Uh, because if I don't know it, then obviously I, uh, it wouldn't affect whatever decision I made. Uh, B, uh, how much is it? Is it $10? Is it $25? Or is it $1,000? Um, $500? The higher the amount uh, contributed really raises a serious question as to whether or not um, there is at minimal an appearance of of, uh, of uh, impropriety in sitting in that case. The Wisconsin Supreme Court has effectively um, ripped apart the notion that it, a large contributor uh, can still, still present themselves before a particular justice. And, uh, and, and, and the Wisconsin Supreme Court has gotten notoriously bad at that. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, they need to uh, self-recuse in cases where they know full well how much money it was, who contributed, and that the outcome in the case that they're sitting on will have a financial impact on them. I think that's plain wrong. So what, um, what advice do you have to voters who might not have any idea when they see a, a judicial candidate on their ballot? What qualities should a voter look for when it comes to selecting a judge? Well, I'm going to answer this in two parts. The first is, what should they do? They need to go online and find out who this person is, what they're about. You can go into their websites, Legal Women Voters, uh, vote411.org. You can find out all sorts of information about a particular candidate uh, through uh, those methods. Being in a democracy requires voters to step out and take a look at who they're voting for. They, it's legwork, it takes time to do that. So in terms of the quality, what, what a, candidate, a good judge, what's, what, what are the features of a good judge? First of all, this is a person who is impartial. They don't come to the bench with a set agenda. The decisions that they make must be based on the law and on the facts that are before them and are not based on some kind of personal or political agenda. You gotta, you gotta park that at the door. And one way, and, and you can find out whether or not 
a candidate is capable of doing that. Uh, again, taking a look at these websites, even finding pamphlets and, and brochures to see what this particular candidate is talking about, what issues are important to them. And, and maybe read between the lines and try to get a sense um, from those materials as well as from the press, which plays a very critical role as to whether or not this person is gonna be capable of being impartial as they're sitting on the court. Is this person serious about doing justice? Because in my view, that's what the court system is about, is making sure that there is justice in the decisions that are made. And you can, again, through all those resources that I uh, pointed to, find out whether or not this person has that quality. And if they don't, you shouldn't vote for them. And I don't care what other aspects uh, they may have that seem to be important to you. If they're not capable of rendering justice in an impartial way, and it's fair, then they shouldn't be on the bench at all. Why is it important to us who serves on the bench? For a very, very long time in Wisconsin's history, and, and the same can be said about many courts around us, many states around the country, you had really pretty similar viewpoints, primarily, you know, white males, mostly Protestant. If you only have one point of view, and you have different people who are uh, approaching that court, that person is not going to be able to have uh, a good understanding about what that person who is before them uh, has lived. They will lack an understanding of what I consider to be a complete understanding or a more complete understanding of, of what issues might surround that case, might surround this person, and even listening to the evidence. How that, how that judge might think about that evidence will be skewed uh, by their, their basic uh, experience in life. If you bring other people onto the court, and I, I ran on this platform when I ran for the Supreme Court, having diverse views on the court make it richer. It allows for solid decision-making. It, it, it brings all of these diverse viewpoints and, and allows for the court uh, to make decisions that, um, in my view, are fair. A lot of um, judges run uncontested. How do we get more men and women to, um, to want to serve on the bench? I think that's complicated. But one thing uh, I have observed over the years that has uh, driven people away from running for the court uh, is the acrimony in the campaigns. I even had to think about that when I ran for the Wisconsin Supreme Court because uh, candidates now are essentially stripped uh, naked in terms of their life experiences. And it can even extend to who's in their family. A lot of people don't want to expose themselves to that kind of acrimony. It's a very challenging thing to do. The second thing is money. The ability to be able to run for cases, especially at the upper levels, uh, has become almost prohibitive unless you have uh, an interest party um, involved in, in doing fundraising or doing their own advertising on your behalf. Now, that's not as big of a problem in the circuit court, but I note that Dane County has five circuit court races uh, on the ballot in April. None of them are contested at all. Now, there are up and downsides to that. And the upside to it is, is if the judge is doing a good job, there really isn't much of a reason in my view to take them off the bench because you really want people who have experience and understanding about how courts operate, how, what the law is. And if they're doing a good job, then I don't really have much of a problem. But if they're, and, you, and this was mentioned earlier by, by Jolly, if the judge is not doing a good job, yes, it is very difficult to impeach them, but in Wisconsin, you can kick them off by voting for them. But I think you have to deal with the acrimony. You got to try to reduce the toxicity of the elections, and you got to hold the, count, the candidates accountable. <coughs> Do you have any advice for the league, the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin? Obviously, cares very deeply about these issues. Any advice for the league? Dorothy would like to know. 
<laughs> on how we can um, expand the pool of people who are properly prepared, motivated, and enabled to run for state judgeships. Well, is it, that puts the league in an interesting position because um, really effectively what it means is uh, members of the league will go out and recruit candidates effectively. And, um, and I'm not sure if your charter or your, your, your tax status per permits you to do that. On the other hand, people who are members of the league but are not acting on the league's behalf can identify or try to identify good candidates and help them build a campaign. Um, and you know, if you're already involved and active in the in the community and, and in voting, um, you might be able to to do that. Bring a group of people and 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 see whether or not there is somebody or somebody's. Uh, who would be good candidates? And you, you touched on this, but what what are the consequences of uncontested um, judicial elections? You know, big deal. Right. Well, uh, as I indicated, if you if you if there's a judge who is not doing their job properly, and you know that's a kind of a loosey goosey term, was properly. You know, that that can be very subjective. On the other hand, you can make an objective determination as to whether somebody is. You can vote them out of office. You can campaign for the other person who's running against them, uh, assuming you can, can support them and they're, they're a reasonable candidate. Uh, so that is, that is a big way that you can do that. What do you say to people who feel insulated from the courts or, or think that it doesn't affect them? I get very um, disappointed when I hear that. And it just simply uh, demonstrates a lack of understanding of the courts and, and what, what their day-to-day -day work is and, and what they do. Uh, obviously at the municipal court, you know, that's the court where the, the average person attends the most, is, is most uh, involved with. It's really the people's court. That's what I called it when I was sitting on the bench. But these cases, um, affect everybody. And the higher uh, level that the case goes, uh, more people can be impacted by that court's decision. So even if they don't pay any attention to what's going on, don't even know the decision of the case, that case, the law that came out of that case can affect their every day-to-day -day lives. So courts make decisions that affect everyone and can affect them every single day. There is no isolation. They are part of it whether or not they pay attention to it or not. Are there some cases from your career that stand out to you um, that might illustrate that? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I have a list here of six. Let's see, I really thought about it. <laughs> Good. Um, I was the trial judge on the Milwaukee School Choice case. And uh, when the case came to me on the circuit court level, um, there have been several other courts that had decided the case, but the case that I had was really big and, um, and would have, would have uh, impacted how, whether school choice was going to be uh, possible in other uh, school jurisdictions. I made a decision that it was unconstitutional under Wisconsin's constitution rather than the federal constitution, which had a very different slant on it. And uh, it was upheld on the Court of Appeals of Wisconsin Supreme Court, uh, uh, rejected it on, on the grounds of uh, federal case law and totally ignored Wisconsin case law. An another case is, um, this was a really, uh, by the way, I was on the Act 10 cases uh, when I was on the Court of Appeals. And I think most people who were probably listening to this know about that. Um, there is a case uh, that I, sat on on the Court of Appeals where we vacated a criminal conviction of a person who had been in prison for about 25 years. And as it turned out, there was new DNA evidence that was uh, presented that indicated a uh, great possibility and probability that he did not commit the crime. And as it turned out, once we vacated, it went back down to the circuit court and the circuit court dismissed the case. And shortly after that, the actual, the actual perpetrator was caught. In fact, he was already in prison and um, and was uh, was uh, convicted of this particular crime. So getting a person out of prison 
who was falsely accused and prosecuted uh, was one of the most important decisions I think I am sat on. Um, I've got several other cases. Uh, you know, there was an Indian Mounds case here in Dane County where um, uh, the Indian Mounds were being threatened by, uh, by a company. And uh, I ruled uh, really for the first time in Wisconsin that uh, th those Indian Mounds were sacred and uh, could not be touched. And there, there are so many cases I've sat on, thousands, literally. I remember those. They really did have an impact, too. Um, Dorothy wants to know, how can we increase the diversity of judges? Judge Higginbotham. That is a very tricky question. And the reason I say it's tricky is because I've approached various uh, people of color who are highly qualified uh, to sit on the bench. And um, I was really uh, chagrined to learn that people uh, were not interested in sitting on the bench largely because of the money. Um, and especially, there are a lot of folks who go into other areas of law, such as corporate law or patent law, uh, where they can make a lot of money. And what am I going to say? You know, of, of course, that's the right to do it. And there aren't many uh, trial, uh, trial attorneys who are people of color. And frankly, that's really where it happens if you're going to be on the circuit court. You really need to have courtroom experience uh, before you go onto the circuit court bench. So I, a number of years ago, uh, then Justice Lewis Butler and I uh, spoke with the Black Law Student Association at UW Law School urging uh, uh, students to um, be trial lawyers and to seriously consider um, a time on the bench. And as it turned out, one of, one of the people, uh, one of the attendees was Nia Trammell, uh, who was now in the Dane County Circuit Court and is somebody who I mentored for a number of years. Uh, and I mentored Everett Mitchell, and they're both on the Dane County Circuit Court, which is really very wonderful. But um, I think this is a this is a very complicated issue, and I've been very um, I've been unhappy with with the progress, uh, not only in the circuit courts throughout the state, but on the appellate courts as well. Although I really must must point out that uh, Governor Evers has been doing a great job at appointing people of color to to the appellate courts. If you have a question for Judge Higginbotham or for Professor Emery, uh, we have about 10 more minutes to go. So please do post it in chat and we will try to get to it before we, we wrap up. I'm gonna, um, Professor Emery, bring you in on that same question that we had uh, from an attendee. Um, how do you see, how do we increase the diversity of our judges? Um, so I think Judge Higginbotham brought up a very good point and money, yeah, plays a huge factor. Um, I see in the chat that someone put that, yeah, if you've got a lot of student loan debt, law school is not cheap. Um, and so if you're carrying a lot of student loan debt, you want to think about how you're going to pay that off. Um, you're not going to be a judge, right, when you get out of law school. So you're going to practice law for a while. And there are some rules with respect to um, the Supreme Court in particular um, about how long you have to practice law before you can run for a uh, judge in that position. But I do think that, you know, judges are underpaid for what they do. Judges at the state level, um, particularly as Judge already mentioned, um, on the circuit courts and then at the municipal courts, they are workhorses. They do not get to pick and choose what they um, are reviewing in terms of cases. They are, um, you know, dealing with incredible workloads all the time. And so, you know, you compare that salary with making, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a private firm or something as a corporate attorney. Yeah, there's going to be a disincentive. However, I think that, um, you know, maybe law schools need to play more of a role in this and law schools need to encourage um, students. They, they are doing more, they have been for a few decades now, doing more to get diversity into law school with respect to the student body. But <coughs> in terms of, you know, talking to stu law students about what they want to do with their career paths and um, looking at the, the courts and how there is a lack of diversity on the courts and the need for diversity for all the reasons that the judge said. Um, 
yeah, maybe they could encourage students to participate uh, or to think about, I should say, um, planning to be judges at some point. But the other thing that discourages, I think, people from running for judge, as already mentioned, is the money um, and then the scrutiny, the level of scrutiny um, that you can endure because, you know, you are picked apart um, as a candidate and that can scare people off. Joy, I'd like to hop back in here if you don't yes. mind. Yes, go ahead. Um, one, if, if you uh, practice law either as a criminal defense attorney or in a prosecutor's office, that's where you can get a lot of courtroom experience. And there are, there's an increasing number of people of color working in those positions. Question then is, you know, will they eventually want to uh, join the bench? And some do, but again, most of them don't. And um, Part of it could be, um, is, it, it could be a crazy world being a judge. Uh, and it's, it's uh, on the other hand, um, at least you're not up to uh, sitting up at two o'clock in the morning trying to get a brief in that's gotta be filed by eight o'clock the next morning. <laughs> so um, it, in some ways it's easier, in some ways it's not. It's the hardest job I ever had. Uh, very complicated work. And sometimes I had all night jury trials and if you've got a family, that can be very challenging. Yeah. One um, a question from earlier, Janine uh, said, recently the Wisconsin Supreme Court has been exercising original jurisdiction. Is there any way to stop this partisan action? Um, Professor Emery, can you explain um, briefly what original jurisdiction is and whether you think there's any way to stop that? or needs to be any way to stop that. Yeah, so original jurisdiction is when appellate courts act as trial courts. So they are the courts of first instance, the first time a case comes to a court. Um, how do you stop it? Well, I guess you amend the constitution. You have, it, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has a lot of, um, I don't want to say power. Well, I guess I'll say power or authority um, in terms of um, making certain decisions about how they operate. And uh, we saw that when they changed um, the selection process for chief justice um, and other reforms they put into place after the debacles on the court with Act 10. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'd like to, um, not to pass the buck, but I'm going to pass the ball to the judge and hear what he is. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, my personal opinion is that the Supreme Court is exercising way too much original jurisdiction. It seems to me that uh, most of the time that they're doing it lately is on cases that are uh, very politically uh, controversial. In my view, those are precisely the cases that they should stay out until the cases get up to them in uh, according to the uh, natural process. It seems to me that there is a great effort to step in uh, on, on uh, political issues uh, where the court should not go. Uh, and this, like, in my view, it indicates a preference on that court to become more involved in political decision-making, which I think is patently wrong. Um, not even too long ago, even when I was on the uh, Court of Appeals uh, in, in the uh, 2000s, um, the court was very, very reluctant to take original jurisdiction. It was very hard to get in there. These days, it's the, the likelihood that you can get the court to bite on that is, is far more likely. And it's, it's, in my view, is completely inappropriate. Yeah. Well, let me, um, we, we are just about out of our, our allotted time. Before I uh, have some concluding remarks, I would like to hear uh, just very briefly, um, Jolly, concluding remarks from you and from, um, from Judge Higginbotham on why judicial elections matter. So I think a lot of this has already been covered, but judicial elections matter because it matters who's on the bench. And those decisions that they make can impact us in small ways, but in large ways. And the fact that um, some courts are exercising more authority over things than they had in the past, like original jurisdiction and the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, it's really important that we pay attention to who is running for these offices and 
do the legwork as the judge does. That's a requirement of a democracy. So do it and, um, you know, do yourself a favor. Yeah. Uh, judge Higginbotham? I'm, I'm going to use um, one type of uh, uh, situation that uh, highlights what I think is is a real important reason why uh, it's a, it, as to who is sitting on the court. In cases <clears throat> involving um, uh, vehicle stops by police officers, um, a judge the judge has broad discretion at the circuit court level in determining whether or not the evidence. Uh, seized during that search is admissible. <clears throat> when it goes up to the appellate court, there's almost no ability to reverse that circuit court decision because the circuit court has a discretion and if it's a discretionary decision is based on the facts and the law, then it stands. There is nothing an appellate court can deal with that. So it's important who sits on the bench because what lenses are they looking at each case with? What's their life experience? What's their understanding of the, uh, of the possible circumstances of the case? And if they're from just one line of life, they're gonna miss many nuances uh, that are gonna be imperative for them to uh, include in their decision-making. Well, thank you both. Uh, Judge Higginbotham and uh, Professor Emery, this I had learned a lot and I know our attendees are saying the same thing in chat right now, thinking that this was a, was a very valuable discussion. So we appreciate your time and your expertise and um, helping us learn more about the Wisconsin court system and judicial elections in Wisconsin. We will, um, we have more information in chat right now. You can learn more about the, uh, the, the candidates uh, and uh, who is on your ballot, who's running uh, for, for judge and other uh, offices. If you go to vote411.org, you can uh, learn more about it. We also um, have put some uh, resources in chat on uh, the, the different roles of the different branches of the uh, judicial elections that you can um, examine and share if you'd like to. Uh, we will be doing more on these other issues that uh, we talked about. Our next Fair Courts webinar will be on April 13th, again at noon. We will have another panel of guest experts explaining how the, the influence of, of dark or secretive uh, uh, campaign money and weak recusal rules are undermining our Wisconsin courts. We will post more information and registration details on that as uh, very soon. Um, we'll probably put them on the, the, the State League's website very soon. We also will have a closer examination of racial disparities and our, um, in our court system coming up in May. And we will be taking a look at um, law schools and and um, and other ways we can encourage uh, more people of color to uh, to run for or be qualified to serve on the bench. So um, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for being with us on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. I'm Joy Cardine. Thank you for participating today. Let's keep working for fair courts in Wisconsin, and please make a plan to vote in the April fifth spring election. Hope to see you next time.